feeling, my favorite thing, feelings. They talk about how much feelings matter, right? It, it's not important that we all be equal in terms of outcome. What is deeply, deeply important, obviously, is that be, we be equal in terms of how we feel about ourselves. We all have to feel very, very special and warm and fuzzy on the inside. And that's why we have to have things like trigger warnings. Right? Anytime there's something that might offend you, something that might confront you with an idea different than your own, you have to be given a trigger warning because who knows, you could go crazy. It could be too much for you. you know, my, my two, the, the two security guys I work with, both of them served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and somehow they don't need trigger warnings, right? They didn't get trigger warnings when they were in Iraq or Afghanistan. And they're perfectly functional human beings, and they're American heroes because they don't need trigger warnings when people are actually shooting at them. Hey, you... You being in a classroom, you being in a classroom does not require a trigger warning or you're a weakling who shouldn't be in a classroom in the first place. And here's the thing about the trigger warnings. Obviously, they only work in one direction, right? You need a trigger warning if you're on the left. There's no trigger warning if you're on the right. So if some professor asks you to stand up because you voted for Trump so they can single you out, that doesn't require a trigger warning. But if you're in class and you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, that requires trigger warnings. And, and the reason for that is because if you're on the right, then you're obviously guilty, right? You're, you're a member of this class, this group of powerful people, and you don't ever need trigger warnings, and, uh, and you can be routinely aggressed, right? Because you, you're, you're the purveyor of microaggressions. So this brings us to our next term, microaggressions. So the, the term microaggressions is in and of itself really evil. And it's not just bad, it's evil. Because the idea here is not just you're saying something offensive, it's that I have aggressed you. Microaggression, right? And the proper response to aggression is you get to hit me. If I were to hit you, you'd get to hit me back. If I were to aggress you, you'd get to aggress me back. And the left truly sees it this way. Microaggressions are a form of violence, and they talk this way. They say that words are a form of violence. They equate words and violence, which is the end of civilization, by the way. The minute that you equate words and violence, civilization is over. Because if we can't say anything to each other without engaging in violence, we can't live in society together. And the things that they use as examples of microaggression are so asinine, things that require them to find their safe spaces with their Play-Doh and their, and their finger paints. Things like... I'm colorblind. If you say I'm colorblind to someone, this is a microaggression. If you say he or she, that's a microaggression because that's, that's cis-normative. Right? You have to use made-up terms like Z that don't even mean anything and no one knows where it came from or why it is. Right? If you say where are you from, this is legitimately, they call this a microaggression. If you say where are you from, which doesn't mean because you might be, maybe I, I perceive you as a foreigner and you're taking that as, as some sort of insult. I mean, Every time I've asked somebody where they're from, it's typically because I assume they weren't born right here where we're talking. <laughs> but for the left, that's a microaggression. And obviously, if you say something factual politically, that too is a microaggression. And that's to be met with violence. Microaggressions are to be met with violence. So my own personal example of this happening uh, happened. How many of you here have, seen, uh, have watched at any point CNN Headline News? Show of hands. CNN Headline News. That's the entire audience for CNN Headline News. So... <laughs> I was asked to, uh, I was uh, about a year and a half ago now, probably 18 months ago, uh, Caitlyn Jenner was the hot topic of the day, and, uh, and CNN Headline News uh, asked me to come in and talk about the Caitlyn Jenner thing because ESPN was giving Caitlyn Jenner uh, the, the Hero of the Year award. Uh, now, my own perspective on transgenderism, I made this very clear many times, is that I believe transgenderism is a grave and, and tragic mental disorder, and it is cruelty to people with a mental disorder to suggest that their delusions are reality. It's cruel to them because it forbids you from actually finding solutions for people that work. Transgender surgery is not something that has a good body of social science suggesting that it works. And, uh, and I'm much more in favor of scientific solutions, or at least searching for them, than I am in favor of nostrums, where you just pretend that men are women and women are men in completely ascientific manner. That's nonsense. And by the way, it teaches young children that gender confusion is something normal, as opposed to something that we ought to attempt to, to deal with. Uh, and the fact is also, by the way, most, most kids, just statistically speaking, most kids who, can, who think that they are transgender grow out of it. 80% of kids who think they're transgender grow out of it by statistical analysis. So that's my perspective on transgenderism. So they call me in and... Um, so they call me in and, uh, they, and they... Honestly, I think what they did is they just looked in the white pages for conservative, and I'm the only one in a 30-mile radius of CNN in L.A. And so I, so I go in, and the producer turns to me and says, you know, we, really, we, we have no ratings here at CNN Headline News. And I said, right, I know. And the and producer says, uh, I, we really want you to just speak your, speak your mind, say what you think. And I said, we came to the right place. And they said, we, also, I used to produce for Jerry Springer. 
And it was at this point I should have had second thoughts, but uh, I did not. So they, so they bring me into the set, and it's Dr. Drew's show. And so, on the, and so on the panel is Dr. Drew and Psycho Mike and this blonde gal, I don't remember her name. And then ne next to me, there are three people also. So it's me against six lefties, which makes it almost fair for them. So we're... <laughs> So we, uh, so we start this, this debate, and the entire debate is, is Caitlyn, and this is not making fun of Caitlyn Jenner, this is making fun of the media that covers Caitlyn Jenner. The, the, the entire debate was, is Caitlyn Jenner a hero or the greatest hero? Is Caitlyn Jenner somebody who is as heroic as the people who stormed the beaches at Normandy, or is Caitlyn Jenner even more heroic than that? Right? Is it like paratrooper her heroism or Air Force heroism? Like this was the this is the argument, and uh, and so f they go through this whole thing, and it's just a question of how heroic is Caitlyn Jenner. And finally, they come to me, and I say, I don't understand what's. Her they say, Do you think Caitlyn Jenner deserves this award? And I said, Well, for what? Right. Caitlyn Jenner is somebody with a mental disorder who had some surgeries, and I feel terrible for Caitlyn Jenner. What's the, why, where's the heroism exactly? And, uh, and so Dr. Drew starts trying to press it. So the person sitting next to me, I neglected to mention this, is a, is a fellow named Zoe Turr. And Zoe is a transgender woman. So Zoe, is, so Zoe used to be Bob Turr, was the helicopter pilot actually during the O.J. Simpson chase. That's how Bob Turr made his name, and now he's Zoe Turr. So Zoe's sitting next to me and getting very uptight with me saying these things about genetics and science. And so Zoe turns to me and says, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy. So well, I know enough about genetics to know that every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body has a Y chromosome in it, with the exception, ironically, of some of Caitlyn Jenner sperm cells. And the and and he and Zoe just keeps saying it just keeps saying, Yeah, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy. And so finally I turned to Zoe and I said, well, What are your genetics, sir? And it was the And honestly, it wasn't meant as a dig. It's because Zoe Turr is a genetic man, and I treat men as men. The whole debate is about whether men are men or men are women, obviously. So I say that, and Zoe reaches over and grabs me by the back of the neck on national TV and says, if you don't cut that out, I'll send you home in an ambulance. This is on live national TV. And honest to God, my first thought was that doesn't even make any sense. You don't go home in an ambulance. <laughs> But what I said was, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political conversation. Well, the punchline of this is that everybody who's there, all six people, immediately turn, oh, the other five, except for Zoe, the other five turn and immediately say, Ben, how could you have said that? You knew that that was going to make Zoe so upset. You did that. That was deliberately offensive. How could you have been offensive to the pronouns, was, as one woman put it? And that's when I said, facts don't care about your feelings. But the, but the fact is... But the idea was I deserve to be met with actual physical aggression on live national TV for saying sir to a genetic man. And, uh, and by the way, the, the, the aggression didn't stop after that. As, as Zoe went hulking off the set, Zoe turns to me uh, and says to me and growls at me in, an, in a voice an octave lower than my own, I'll see you in the parking lot. And, uh, and security had to escort me out to, the, out, to the, out to my car, bizarre evening. Uh, and, uh, and then later on Twitter, Zoe threatened to curb stomp me, all of which I thought was just deeply unladylike behavior. <laughs> But again, the idea is that microaggressions are something that have to be met with aggression. And that's why they say it on campus, because the idea is if you say something you don't even know is offensive, but is taken as offensive, people get to hurt you. And then finally, once you've had all the trigger warnings and all the microaggressions have been policed, you finally end up with your idiotic safe space. Right? The safe space where no one gets to talk, your own little bubble of happiness, which doesn't exist in the real world. Because you're going to graduate college, all these idiots are going to graduate college and infect our workplaces. And they're, going to, and they're going to go there and expect that no one is ever going to say anything with which they disagree. Or they're going to the political world and nobody will ever say anything that offends them in any way. Now those of us on the right understand that you're going to be offended every five seconds in politics. If you're politically active, someone will say something offensive to you almost literally every five seconds. There'll be something that you disagree with, something that you think is stupid, something that you, and, and the good part of that is that you have to learn how to counter that. You have to learn how to respond to that. You have to learn how to be a bigger person or you have to learn how to, how to you have to learn knowledge. You have to have a knowledge base to refute all these things. But if you're in a safe space, then it's sort of like the, the kids who, who were very wealthy during the 1930s, during the polio epidemic. It actually makes you more susceptible to polio because if you never actually 
deal with germs and then all of a sudden you hit all the germs at once you get polio and that's what it is for all these kids these kids go to college campuses they live in their safe spaces and then when they leave they are not equipped in any way to deal with actual real conversation and so their solution is a bigger government that can still continue to promote this kind of fake society that doesn't really exist and this is making a generation of leftists who are just nuts I mean just crazy you know people who suggest the University of Missouri that they have to have a protest space that is all black Right? This is what happened at University of Missouri. Or they have to have separate black housing. This is happening now. It happened at USC. Uh, I think it's happening at University of Missouri also. Separate black housing, to which the KKK says, absolutely, let's do that. <laughs> it also creates people who are aggressive. If you, if you have a perception of the world that every time somebody says something to you, it's because they're attempting to hurt you, and you get to be aggressive in response, it makes you more aggressive. Which is why it's very funny. You see the left keep promoting these hoax stories about Trump supporters randomly attacking lefties. But the fact is that every time I speak on a campus, there's a near riot, apparently. And that's, be, that, that's not really because of anything that I'm saying. I think that it's more because there's just someone on campus who disagrees with them. And that cannot be tolerated in any way. And that's extending over the course of the United States. There's a November 2015 Pew poll found 40% of millennials 18 to 34 thought that the government should prevent people from making statements offensive to minority groups which involves repeal of the First Amendment. I mean, it's a, it's a stunning statistic. Here's the thing. America is the greatest place on the planet. Everybody has a shot at victory here. We do. And nobody cares enough to stop anybody. Right? The idea that we are all sitting in this room plotting how to stop lefties or stop black people from succeeding in life, we don't care enough about anybody to do that because nobody cares that much about us. This is the beautiful thing about living in a society where you care about your family and your friends and your community, but you're not sitting around nefariously plotting to keep other people down. And one of, the, one of the great things about being a leftist is you think that the entire universe is focused in on you, but the universe doesn't care about you, right? The, n none of us are sitting around, like, in your off hours, are you sitting around thinking how to keep that sophomore co-ed from succeeding at her job? Like, no one is doing that. But if you can create this system in your mind where everyone's preventing you, then you get to blame the rest of society. So people need to, to buck up a little bit, and it's incumbent on us to speak the truth about this, and that's sometimes going to be offensive. Sometimes it means that your feelings are not justified. When I say facts don't care about your feelings, I'm not trying to be callous, although frankly I don't care that much. But, it's, but, but what I'm really saying is that when you, when you value feelings over facts, you actually end up hurting more people. When you value feelings over facts, you end up destroying the system. And when you value feelings over behavior, you end up justifying some really bad behavior. So it's incumbent on all of us to go out there and preach decency and be decent. Now, when I say preach decency and be decent, I don't mean in response to people who are indecent. Indecency does not call for a decent response. Indecency should be met by, by punching back twice as hard. But it is our responsibility to go out there and preach decent behavior and be, the, be better people, preach better ideas. If we do that, we will succeed. And I know that's what all of you are involved in doing here at Turning Point. One of the things I love about speaking at Turning Point is usually when I come down to Palm Beach to speak at an event, the average age is somewhere between 70 and